Hello, today is December 15, 2016. This is Max. We are at humancolony.org. You can write to me in comments to this video or you can um, email me at max at humancolony.org. Today I will talk again about how to stay afloat, how to be how to go through depression and how to come back. When I was uh, in school, like middle school, I uh, was in pretty bad situation. My <clears throat> uh, stepfather was sort of aggressive and demanding and my mother was escaping and not much there. I had a yeah, a fairly dysfunctional family. In school I was an outcast. I was kind of a little bit on the fat side and um, yeah, I was fat, I wore glasses, I was unpopular and um, people would be aggressive and I would not know what to do. So basically socially I was underdeveloped. So I um, read a lot of science fiction. That was my world. I just, I didn't realize I was from there. I don't think I realized, but I actually lived in this world of science fiction. I just swallowed books one after another and I was very lucky my, that very aggressive, <laughs> that very aggressive st stepfather uh, was crazy about books and had ways to, to get a lot of books. So the whole little apartment was filled with science fiction books, which was wonderful, very good quality. So at some point, my, um, my parents just made the decision that I, I'm too withdrawn from, um, from the world that they prohibited me from reading the books. And I was stupid enough to follow the advice. <laughs> so basically I stopped reading books and um, I at the same moment, uh, my uh, friends decided that they don't like this school, they want to go to another better school. And they would take a subway and get accepted to a mathematically oriented school. So I followed them. I think I followed them a year later, so their advice wasn't didn't affect me immediately, but I just followed them later because they mentioned that it is a great school. And I was accepted, and this was just a paradise. I uh, became a part of the class which was made of the same kind of nerds as I am. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, but I felt home there. And more than that, I met friends, and there were two friends, so there was like a trio, classical three three boys uh, and we liked each other I wasn't a leader I was kind of yeah I was a second person in the tree I guess I don't know I was one of the I, I <laughs> sometimes I was the first sometimes I was the second sometimes I was the third but we had a clear leader which wasn't me and um, he was just more developed and he was a very talented leader I think when he became older I don't think I think he may, I might have lost that the drive but in school he was just extraordinary beautiful confident you know it, it's like a miracle but I think it's it's known in psychology that alpha male would uh, get fed by the energies from from the followers so we gave we gave him our trust and love and he 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 shined he really shined it was just perfection i loved him so um and the third let's give him a, a name yeah i guess we would call him a dicky right he had another name but uh, a russian equivalent an english equivalent would be like a dicky which uh, corresponded to his, his behavior he was intelligent and intellectual but there was that manly boyish bravery and he was yeah he was diplomatic he was dipl at, at the same time he was diplomatic and he was socially wonderful 
So the third person in this group, um, his name would be translated as, yeah, the ghost. He would be ghost. So yeah, he was super pure. He was super emotional. He was from very strict family. Like I was, when I visited him, I was really uh, amazed, I guess, negatively amazed. How, how do you call negative amazement? I don't know, there is no word. I just couldn't understand how it is possible. But his whole apartment was super, super, super clean and cleaned up. And his uh, frying pans, his mother's frying pans were, were made of aluminum as everybody's. And they shined with aluminum. It was like no, no black stuff on them whatsoever, right? So she would clean them every day to absolute shiny aluminum, silver kind of brightness. So in that family, you, you really have to be like crazy, right? And he was a talented drummer and crazy about drumming. And he had tons of music around homemade music, so uh, they, they formed the band I, and I learned from the musicians who like, were really talented musicians in school. It's, uh, it would correspond, I guess, to the 8th and ninth grade in uh, American school. So I, I learned a little bit. I, I got a guitar, a very a cheapest one, which, which can't really play much, but, but I got a guitar and I, I started learning. And there was, a, there was a lot of good stuff we, we did. We were nice boys, intellectuals, from good families. All the stuff we did was good. But, uh, you know, our, our, mm, class, our, our class teacher was amazing and he took our class to... So he would drum uh, after school, before the parents would come home. I, I think maybe he would drum even the, when the parents were there. He would drum uh, in school, after school. So. It was 70s when uh, the time, it was a time of rock, great rock and great drummers. Legacy of drummers of 60s, right? So, and we had other <laughs> wonderful musicians around, young musicians, talented. So things developed and our school class teacher uh, took us many times to um, hiking trips. Oh, for weekends with sleepovers in tents. No, we didn't have tents at that time. We built our uh, we, we built sh our own shelters in the wild forest, and we, we stayed in the forest. Everything was nice, intellectual. We were nice kids. So the teacher and uh, his, uh, I guess, another teacher friend would uh, would drink a little bit, and then we would all, all sing songs. And uh, that's where we started playing guitar. I don't remember when we started playing guitar, but I, I guess we just sang songs even without guitar. Yeah, a cappella. Later we started playing guitar, maybe a little bit. So I guess, uh, yeah, we were the core of the class. Three of us would be the leadership. It was an amazing, um, amazing feeling. After all this negativity, it was an amazing feeling. So. And uh, there was a summer camp, the whole class went for the summer camp, it was great with all the negativity, but it was, a, you know, two summer camps. And the second summer camp, by some reason, the spirit, he didn't come. Why didn't he? I guess that's a mystery, maybe his parents didn't let him, maybe he had a different idea. We were surprised, but I don't know, we didn't push him, I mean. We respected each other, he couldn't go, so he couldn't go. Yeah, so I guess all of us, I think we were, I was 15, he was 14, more, maybe, more or less. So we come back in the summer, after the summer camp, and uh, he was there because he didn't come. And we just find out that he uh, killed himself in the suicide. And uh, we didn't know what to think. We were supposed to think something but uh, we just didn't know it was like complete numbness you don't understand what's happening how is it possible and what I guess it was the first death you experience um, 
so we find out we found out that it was because of um, unhappy love um, and later we found a little more detail that he went to a summer camp another summer camp and uh, he fell in love with a girl and she m responded to him nicely and then uh, at the end he discovered that she is I guess engaged and is pregnant and uh, and she doesn't want him anymore I guess uh, we don't know I don't know more detail that's that's still a mir mir uh, mystery so the only thing the only additional thing we found out was that um, when there was a funeral we went to the funeral she was there she wore red which is stupid and she was angry looked angry which is stupid and that's that's about all we know and she wasn't you know she was just a girl I guess maybe a little older and that is it uh, we, we visited his parents and saw them kind of being destroyed he was the only son and uh, they just were still cleaning up his apartment but but that was it right for them it was I don't know it felt like it but that was it for them they didn't have much fire anymore and that was it for the, for a lot of things so our friendship basically broke right oh gosh now I start remembering <laughs> yeah our friendship actually broke <laughs> before he, he killed himself right what happened um, so we separated three of us so he went to a different camp I guess and I and uh, the Dicky went <laughs> and the rest of the class went to another summer camp and I was in love as usual I, I was always I know had a crush on, so on, on somebody and always without much return just kind of with a little bit of hope and uh, the Dicky he kind of took advantage of me and uh, he had a nice relationship with the girl I liked I loved yeah and I was so kind of uh, out of the world I just didn't know what to think about it I wasn't crushed I didn't really <laughs> I guess it was it was a parallel situation right my best friend takes takes my girl but I just uh, at the moment I I didn't realize what is happening I don't know I had I have no clue I guess I wasn't just there that's that's my understanding I wasn't there I um, I don't remember anything else it was like the whole world was strange right so I think I, I knew how to be how to be sad about unhappy love but I wasn't I, I, I didn't feel much uh, I just felt that things go wrong and it was the year I think 1979 the whole year was crazy right it was about the time the, the, the earth the, the television was speaking about very likely nuclear conflict that's what I remember I guess 79 and 80 it was in the air so the whole thing was like crazy and anyway after that, the, the next year, the last grade, which would correspond, I guess, maybe to the 10th grade in the United States, maybe 11th, um, you were like 15, 16, uh, the whole thing went kind of differently. I sort of separated from my previous friends, made new friends, fell in love after, had a crush after another girl from a different parallel class, so, so... I wasn't that depressed but a year later again there was a situation when that girl didn't like me and at that time I had I had I was depressed I was really like I wanted to kill myself <laughs> I didn't know what to think I just knew that you know that was too much there was with graduation of the school there was so much pressure to produce nice grades and uh, and that's where I just I, I couldn't take the pressure I'm still pretty bad with pressure but at that point I was just no I'm I quit I don't I don't want that I don't want that I don't know what to do I'm desperate but because the ghost killed himself 
my best out of you know well just my friend he killed himself right so he kind of taught me that it's not it's not a solution it was just like obviously it was obvious I wanted but I couldn't it was clearly clearly not 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 the way to go so you know that helped me a lot it helped me many times in my life when I was like pressed against the like wall nothing works I there is no solution but you know I knew the the, the exit is is not is not a, um, the answer either so I I, I didn't so at, the, at that moment um, end of the end of the 10th grade end of school I just sort of uh, for a few hours I, I was considering to, to go to leave home and just you know go travel <laughs> uh, but uh, so I, I basically I, I made this step but as I made it it was clear like there is nothing to go in the Soviet Union we just you can you can't really escape in the Soviet Union there is no hitchhiking there is no jobs for kids um, you know the, it was uh, 1980, you can't really go by yourself. You are supposed to be assigned somewhere. Everyone is tracked. You know, you can't just get on the train and go anywhere because uh, you wouldn't be accepted anywhere. There is no place to go. It's not a free world. So I was smart enough not to go anywhere. <laughs> and I didn't have money to go, so, so escaping wasn't an idea go traveling going to travel was not idea and obviously I, uh, I sort of kind of cared about my parents and for my uh, mother and my teacher it was a big a big stress a kid disappears and then they knew there was something wrong so and one, one killed himself a year ago so so for them it was big I didn't think about it because I was focused on my, you know, crushed hopes. But um, but I came back. My mom called the teacher, and after that, he basically he didn't speak to me ever. He basically was really offended, and he took a person that was his one of favorite students, and I um, I was. I didn't think about them, about him you know, at the time. And when I came, once I kind of came to the uh, class reunion and he just, he just ignored me. Okay, uh, I guess my mom forgave me, you know. I don't know what, she, what, what did she think, but uh, I guess she cried maybe, I don't know. I don't remember. I was so self-centered and not social much. Yeah, something of that sort. So I will jump to another story which uh, uh, which happened, I guess, seven years later. It was not seven. It was an I was pretty sure 1984. Uh, part of the story you already heard, but maybe. But basically, the idea is, was that. I was in the Moscow University chemical department and um, we had uh, a permission not to go to the army. I guess there is some word which I don't know, exception or something. So we were legally permitted not to go to the army but for two years but we had to go to the army for two months and we would be trained as uh, junior officers and it was still pretty bad so I would uh, I ended up in the hospital with dysentery because the conditions were like dirty and hot and um, I it just pretty bad for me and morally we were repressed in many ways um, so I ended up in the hospital, very sick, very sick, like for quite a while, maybe more than two weeks. 
and there there were kids who would uh, also get get there with uh, with certain dysentery diseases like infectious diseases mostly dysentery and uh, they would recover fast and they were the kids from uh, from the two-year army basically I guess it's called conscri conscription so if you are a certain age and you didn't get uh, to the university or you didn't get certain medical uh, um, I guess it's called, would be called exception then uh, then you're screwed you have to be in the army so they will like it to get this injury then they would spend free time <laughs> in the hospital which was kind of you didn't have to work you didn't have to do much you just sit in, you know there and uh, do nothing and um, the guard, the guards on the hospital it wasn't guarded as much so there was a opportunity an opportunity to escape so two kids escaped from the hospital and from the army it was 1984 um, and that was sort of an interesting step you become an outlaw basically um, The the main way the the government kept kept the army soldiers from running away was they wouldn't get passports and everyone in the Soviet Union had to have a passport document like a paper with a photograph. So when you get to the army, they would take your passport and they would take your civil dress, almost like in prison. Same thing. So army was the same as prison, you know. <laughs> All males have to serve in the prison and be screwed up in, ma in many, many ways. Tortured in many, many ways, psychologically and physically and beaten and so on. So, um, yeah, and kids, from, and kids in, the, in, in the hospital would tell bad stories about, you know, about the army and how they were... Uh, repressed and screwed so um, so if you run from the hospital then you have to go somewhere right and you wouldn't have a dress so somehow these kids they they got some sort of a dress which would work a little bit maybe they won't be visible they would be um, it's like running pants and, and short. Um, but then they would be like hiding for the rest of their lives, right? It was 1994, we didn't know that Soviet Union would um, become much weaker in a couple years and fall apart in a, in, by 80. So in six years everything will be over. But we didn't know. We knew that for almost 70 years it was uh, it was strong, and uh, there was no hope at that moment. So basically, you, these kids decided to become outlaws, most likely for the rest of their lives. That was a pretty big step. Um, obviously, no one from the hospital, from that room, nobody would uh, report. At least I. I I, I wouldn't think that anyone would report. So they were gone and I guess at some point they would be noticed and police would look for them. And uh, you know, in Russia you travel usually by, by train, so on train stations there are special army police uh, units which would be busy ca catching uh, people running from the army. I guess it's called defecting, so they would ca capture defectors. So these kids would have to go other, other, any other way. But there are other ways, other ways. Um, you know, we all knew that because it's like the culture was how do you avoid police and travel and so on. So their, their plan was to come back home and uh, uh, you know, live with friends 
and uh, I don't know, do something. I guess find, maybe buy a fake document or something like that. Fake the documents, I have no clue actually. They discuss it kind of vaguely, but they say they have at least this, the place to, to visit. So, which is nice, at least you have the place to visit and then you start from there. So yeah, and the end of the story was that at that moment I was thinking they are like suicidal, but uh, in a couple years it became clear that uh, they were lucky and uh, in four years after that it was clear they were really lucky and they were just wiser than everyone else who was afraid. But you know, I don't think they were smart, they just kind of just took their chance. So about depression, I, a few years ago it was very strong for me. I don't know, it goes by waves, but again it also really depends on your perception, like how do you judge your own situation. So some so same situation, if people look at you and think, uh, think that you're a loser and you believe them, then you are sorry that you're a loser, but sometimes just one person saying that they are, uh, believe you are great and um, they uh, estimate you very highly is sufficient to, <laughs> to change the, the whole situation completely to the, uh, uh, to the otherwise and you would believe you're, you're great, right? So having that one person who would lift you up is absolutely essential and, uh, and if you cannot, cannot judge yourself positively, how do you call it? Cannot estimate yourself positive, cannot decide that you deserve can they decide that your situation is great, then, then finding someone, finding, I call it a muse, a muse is more like inspiring, but someone inspirational, one person is sufficient, more of course is better, but someone who can uh, lift you up is the key. And in my previous video I, I told about my best friends, where we would go and uh, who would keep us up. You know, when we were confused, we would go to our friends who were experienced and they would, uh, would uh, just talk to us and tell stories and sometimes they would tell stories which you wouldn't know why they're telling them, but later you would realize that was to lift you up. They wouldn't go directly, but they would tell it indirectly. So, Classifying people. Some people have this. <laughs> some people have the talent to uh, to put you down, and some people have the, have a talent to to lift you up. I, I call this muse a muse, right? And uh, I, I value them very much. Those who who can inspire you. They might have no other talents. They might not even understand you. But by some spiritual mechanics, they have the capacity to to inspire you. Right. So recently I have been depressed. <laughs> it sounds funny, but but yeah it was truly true true uh, you know a depression when you are sad is one thing but the depression when you just lose interest like things which were interesting to you just become uninteresting like things which were charged for you becomes discharged. It's just, yeah, everything is uninteresting. That is uninteresting. That is uninteresting. That is boring. The whole thing becomes boring. That's kind of, you know, that's close. <laughs> that is close to death. I, physically, I was okay, actually. There was pain, but, but um, usual, nothing exceptional. And um, what do you do in this case? I. I, that's kind of so familiar that I don't even have to invent much. I do usual stuff. When I needed, it somehow coincided I needed to complete something, so I used nicotine. I don't get addicted. I kind of used a couple of cigarettes and stopped. And these cigarettes I would smoke only maybe for 10% of the cigarettes. So it would be, uh, a usual cigarette contains about, I think, I think 30 milligrams of nicotine, so 10% of that would be like 3 milligrams of nicotine. Which for my 
psychology for my biochemistry would be a medium heat. It would hit you, but then it would last for maybe three hours and then go back. The problem with nicotine was that when I stopped it, it stopped smoking and still I felt the wave. You kind of you start the wave, so your whole biochemistry starts kind of oscillating back and forth. And you really want a cigarette. <laughs> you just start maybe two cigarettes and then you want another one after a certain number of hours. And if you don't, you become sick. So I was sick. but. Um, I knew if I continue, I would be like even more sick. So, so that wasn't much choice. So logically, I just understood you know, uh, that I couldn't continue. Uh, I tried now in California, marijuana is illegal, and uh, I tried marijuana. It sort of kind of makes you numb. Yeah, that's the best description. It makes the pain numb, but uh, I just noticed I started to drop stuff. And there was something supernatural. Stuff would fall, like different things would fall, even if I don't touch them. <laughs> it's more like poltergeist. You would, you would just move a little bit, and that would um, start a series of things falling, 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 and then things would fall on the floor. And it was just funny. I just, <laughs> I would, would move a little bit, and then would things would fall on the floor. It would leave this one, and the next one would fall on the floor. So. It was a terrible demonstration that that um, marijuana makes um, you uncapable of physical functioning, and it's not my preference because I like things to be under control, especially physical ones. So in marijuana, you lose control, uh, but otherwise, I guess a couple of um, couple of times again, it kind of allowed me to to relax a bit just a bit. It kind of messes up your mind. You cannot get really high because to get high you need to be harmonious and I find that marijuana makes you sort of mel molten, like melts you. Um, it de 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 bre breaks apart the, the connections but you are not you can't assemble yourself. You kind of you just melt, become liquid or ga gaseous. So it's not, you can't get very high spiritually. I guess the, the, the word high on marijuana is something different. You, like, you are not physical, but you're not spiritual either. You're kind of in between. So to get like, coordinate, like for good or uh, spiritual upliftment, you need a certain vibration in your body and in your brain to be at high amplitude, so for that, for that your nerves have to be functioning and produce a certain resonance. So clearly marijuana breaks all that resonance. Nicotine creates certain resonance, but it's very grounding, it's very physical. You kind of, you just discover, oh, I landed up in this reality and I'm completely here. So that heat of nicotine is very strong for me, especially after not smoking, I just kind of do a couple puffs and then boom, oh, I am a nurse, wow. I can feel it, I, I'm fully here. Normally I'm like 10% here, right? sometimes 30%, and here like I'm 99% here, wow. I can see that world, I landed, I am down here. And it feels okay, all right. So so that's, that's nicotine marijuana. And alcohol, um, okay. Again, amounts were like really tiny. <laughs> For everyone, it would be like laughable. People would, would like normally drink it after after lunch, right? During during the work day. But um, what did I drink? Hold on. It's called vermouth. Vermouth. It's kind of a sweetened, sweet uh, sweet wine with certain herbs. But anyway, it's like half a cup or something. <laughs> But again, it kind of it melts it melts your anxiety. I did maybe once or twice before the sleep, and it allows you to melt things. So altogether, that is kind of just chemistry. Um, showers, and um, yeah. when I was an uh, access to swimming pool, swimming pool was and jacuzzi was was great. 
California is great about jacuzzi, so in jacuzzi it just physically melts certain, certain stuff. And music, of course, music. So I would I would indulge in com being in headphones, good headphones, all the day, all the day, like all all awake in time. I would be in headphones, and it would be either music when I, I need to do something and think, and when I don't need to think, then I would do audio books, and I would do my favorite already kind of books, which I. I come back to them all the time. And uh, in English it would be Yes Minister, Yes Prime Minister from Audible. That make, keeps me up. And um, some Russian books. And actually there is a, an English translation. This book is available on Amazon. It's called Definitely Maybe by Strugatsky. Definitely Maybe by Strugatsky. T-S-K-Y. And of course there is Jim, and Jim does miracles. <laughs> so I have sessions with Jim one with Jim once a week, and uh, usually it's it's sufficient just to wait until the meeting with Jim and um, and then ask the cur or archangels to <laughs> to help, and they do come and help. Uh, and also I have a Reiki a couple times a week, and again sometimes it just. Uh, it's just waiting. You wait until you come to your healer and they would put, put you back together. That's that simple. So, And of course the family and, uh, and friends, family and friends is absolutely essential. So finally, it is just waiting. Uh, you know, you get used to that, you know it's it's a, a phase and it is kind of a phase of spiritual development sometimes it is your personal and very often it is kind of universal you look around and see the signs that it's for everybody around it is not you only going through the phase but the whole group of friends like kindred spirits they go through the same collapse so when you realize it's not yours that there are others who go through that in parallel because they kind of link together synchronistically to you then it's much easier right so you just wait and the, the main thing which is to fight these depressions is not what you do when you're depressed but when you get out let me repeat because I guess that's that's the main message of today so to fight depression, it doesn't really matter what you do when you're depressed. It, the matter, it matters what you do when you get out, when you lift yourself, when you get lifted up. Then you kind of build a structure, build the support, build a network, build the habits and system which helps you to next time to dive not as deep. Depression is unavoidable, especially for spiritually awakened people when you are numb, like when you are unawakened, when you are asleep spiritually and sensually then you don't get depressed because you don't even know what feelings are but when your feelings are awakened then you go through cycles of depression and uh, you feel them at the, the, the price for being awakened, right? but uh, as you prepare yourself there is a wind, I'm not on the ocean, there is a wind, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't really protect you from that wind. I guess I need to buy that thingy that protects you from the wind. Not you, the microphone. And anyway, the, the system of support, which is primarily the network, the family, friends, network of friends. Again, uh, periodic, weekly gym, weekly rake healers and so on the books, the headphones, the system for keeping yourself up. The understanding, right, the understanding, understanding of the mission, I guess. You don't really know what's the next step in the mission, but you know you're on the mission because you have the feeling, you have lots of confirmations you're on the mission. And these confirmations, you just remember, you keep them, you keep track of them. 
like important messages come to me not once like once I feel it in the shower like I take a shower and there is a message coming okay I take a notice of the message and then if it comes the same day, day through like another few different sources then you realize it's confirmed and it comes like through random emails through random web pages through random phone calls through people children talking randomly books you open a book and the first word you see is just that word that confirms yes you the message you got is right and the mechanics of that you you know is that what is random for us for the spirit is uh, under full control they have the the option to put, put random things for you in order and how do they do that I guess it's just in the nature of the matrix like things which are random for us that are under full, full their control when I uh, now I daily work with uh, tarot cards tarot cards are easy and they're cheap actually you can buy them for like for 13 dollars on Amazon I like the ones which are called Muha. M U C H A M U C H M U C H A Muha Muha Terra cards $13 on Amazon and they come with a little book and that's all you need. So you um, mix them well and mix them um, not only in the order but you also put them upside down you put like half of the deck you turn upside down and then mix again upside down mix again and then uh, you pull five cards at random and you just look at the description of that card and that would be the instruction for you for the next for the for, you know for the next step basically next step instruction in which direction to move and in which direction not to move and um, it's not that you meditate and create a certain pattern of the card not that you pull the right cards but when you pull the cards the images on the card they create the ones which are suitable for you your spirit guides basically your higher self and spirit guides give you the message by showing you the images which are suitable they don't even have to mess to uh, mix the cards or rearrange them because as long as you don't follow they are free to put any image anywhere they don't really have to reshuffle even right so that's how the matrix works I'm pretty sure it's like it makes a lot of sense when you kind of analyze that's how the matrix works and what is the mission I guess you know it's uh, the contact the uh, uh, ascension your spiritual growth and um, collective networking and all that stuff and there is a transformation and the old system is sort of dissolving maybe not even falling it's more like dissolving and the new system has been synthesized by you yeah so it's the art of networking and building new businesses which are decentralized it's more like little small tiny businesses kind of communities um yeah new the news which okay then the news from the <laughs> for the last few days i i'm listening to to russian to one russian thinker and teacher he's actually two years younger than i you know i'm so old now 52 he's 50. uh he's uh, sort of a mature politician and uh, a professional uh, literary I guess it's called commentator hold on yeah I would be like literature journalist I guess that's how we would call it and um, a, a teacher yeah I'm also teach he's teaching in the United States and in Russia his name is Dmitry Bikov, Dmitry Bikov, B Y K O V. He speaks in, in Russian mostly. So, um, Dmitry Bikov, he is one of the most advanced Russian thinkers, as far as I know. And there is tons of him on YouTube, and he is just so advanced. I, it's hard to compare him, I guess. 
I guess John Stewart of the Daily Show, Allen Ginsberg. I guess there is much of much in him of Bashar. Yeah, he he has that Bashar's property of ability of collab condensing time. So the speed of his thinking and talking, it, and the depth of his thinking and talking is like Bashar's. It's just so superhuman. That, that's all, all I can say. So that superhuman Dmitry Bikov um, says an interesting thing that he thinks that Russia will come back and Russia will um, uh, drop that stupidity that it has now, that negativity, and will catapult up into the high level of intellectual spirituality. All right, let's say better, in high le level of intellectualism and spirituality. So I guess um, there is not much to do until that happens, in terms of, no, not much to do with Russia, you know, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens because there is a potential there. What he says is interesting. He says he's, a, he's teaching students of uh, high school and uh, uh, university level, and the new generation of students that just came to him are the new people. He talks about the, you know, that very birth of the new human kind, new Homo sapiens, the sixth race. He says that you know this is it. They are coming. They are being born in Russia, in America too. But he says in Russia there is something extraordinary. So new kids which. They didn't experience Soviet Union. They were born a few years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, they, uh, they are just new, new, new geniuses of new kind. I guess when they grow up, that that might happen. That the Earth will shift. So, the hope is in the generation which is already born, which are the kids now. So that's what will uh, save the world. I guess it's a wonderful point to <laughs> to finish the talk about depression. <laughs> there is a hope. The new kids are coming and uh, they will make it happen. So until then we are the ones who hold the vibration and when they come we would be the ones who would transfer the you know, if they want to take, they will. We would transfer something. We would we'll transfer the vibration to them, and then we can go. I guess. <laughs> Maybe that that transfer would be appreciated, but he's afraid, and <laughs> it's it's a good fear that uh, they will just wipe us out altogether. They would just come and start in the new earth and start a new vibration, and it will be so high, we'll have nothing to do with it, right? Can you imagine that? I, I can easily imagine, like, they would be like aliens, maybe. They would be so bright, so nice, so beautiful, so um, unaccessible, unreachable. It's like, uh, yeah, sometimes I see American students, and I'm so much out of that world. They don't see me, I don't see them, because it's like, there is a barrier, a vibrational barrier. I, you know, I cannot bring them to me. They cannot bring me to them. It's just too far. I'm so screwed by all that pain. And uh, yeah, I speak to the. Yeah, it was another thing. I, I'm sort of out of depression, right? I, I kind of recover, and I feel like I'm good, right? I'm good. I, I'm strong. I'm spiritual, and so on. I just did certain. Uh, wonderful things and I'm proud of myself and I meet someone spiritual and um, how do you call it psychic and she says all is wonderful but what is that deep sadness in you what is the deep tragedy I'm thinking oh gosh I think I do still have it right deep tragedy deep, deep sadness it's still in me so that's what's the difference she says like you no know, there are bright Bright souls, bright people who are so bright, so positive, there is nothing holding them back. And in you I feel that sadness, that kind of reservation, that... Let me describe it. It's like, you remember um, T.S. Eliot, 
describing the end of the world, saying it will end not as a bang, but as a whisper. <laughs> that is about us. You know, we have so much big hope, but yet there is that fear and that, um, what do you call it? Habit of failure, habitual failure, that um, we are afraid, yeah. So stepping forward, the new generation it won't will not be afraid because it will be nice and clean and pure and uh, unbroken and uh, not not used to failure and that's why it would uh, go fast, go bold. And we are so messed up that you know we would uh, have complexes and doubts and uh, when we meet Jesus, what we ask him, right? Um, we would ask, what's the percentage of my DNA, right? Something like that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so that's it for today. Uh, stay up. Stay high. Um, keep Take it easy. Uh, call me if you have to. Write to me. Um, my number is 585-7054. A Skype max 2040507 max 2040507 and email max at humancolon.org I invite help uh, making videos like doing video editing uh, helping with webinars pressing buttons and moderating when the channel goes on the other side there is no, it would be very nice to have someone to keep the vibration and uh, basically moderate the things and uh, there is still the need for someone to take charge of converting those terabytes of the videos we created into audio format which is easy but it takes technical skill and then uploading and setting up the automatic internet radio and automatic podcasts I could do that but it would take like weeks of of work so it's it, it's an interesting project I think it should, it should be done uh, and just uh, if you want to join our webinars write to me and I will add you to our chat chat boxes where people meet and discuss, uh, discuss things also when people finally get in these chat boxes they say and what's next and next you connect one to one you uh, pick the people in the webinar who you like. You listen to our um, webinars on Hukula at YouTube. Pick the ones you like and when you get to chat boxes in Skype and Google Plus you connect to these people and just say hi every morning and how are you? And the ones which need help you give them help. Alright. Have a good day. Um, talk to you later. Goodbye.